it's possible, we don't know, that the 1973 decision that legalized abortion nationwide could be overturned. And if it is, it would be because you and I prayed and fasted and got the word out that God desires life, not death. It's not an optional issue, it's intrinsic. Because God creates every human being in his own image and he will not stand for a continuation of a nation that does not honor all of its people. We will not have life as a people if we don't give life to all of us. And so there's a book, it's called Transfigured, Patricia Sandoval's Escape from Drugs, Homelessness, and the Back Doors of Planned Parenthood. And Father Donald Calloway wrote a foreword to it. Are you ready to read one of the most powerful conversion stories ever written? Seriously, are you? This story is made for the big screen and I pray it makes it there someday. It's that incredible. So Father Calloway also goes on to say that all people, especially Catholics, must read the story of redemption and that it was very, very healing for him. Pray fast, but also please share this story. It's an easy thing to do to share a book because it changes the mind and hearts of people who don't think it's a big issue, whether we allowed the unborn to live or not, or who've never really known anything about it, or who go against it, or who just want to read a really exciting story. This changes minds and hearts. It gets them fervently excited about the issue. And you can give the book to people who just want to have hope, who just want to see something beautiful in the world and hope for their own lives because the book is hardly just about abortion. I'm just going to conclude before I show you this interview I did with the protagonist of the book, my good friend Patricia Sandoval. Wow. You're going to love her when she speaks. She's a powerhouse. And this is what someone wrote to her. She says, I'm a virgin and obviously never had an abortion. I started reading your book Transfigured on January 1st and I finished it by the end of the day. That's how I spent my New Year's. It is so unfair to talk about your story just in regards to pro-life. It is much more than that. I will soon be reading it again because there is so much to it. So she read it in one day. She wants to read it again. This is the response the people have to the book. Has a brand new cover, brand new words from Father Calloway who says, please call on St. Joseph before you read it. And so importantly, as you will find out if you stick through the whole interview I've done with Patricia Sandoval, toward the end of it, we'll talk about how this relates to whether we survive as a people and a nation at all. God bless you. Welcome to Find Your Way Home. I have a very special guest and an extremely urgent and important message. And her name is Patricia Sandoval, good friend, pro-life speaker, has her own show on EWTN, and I'm very blessed to know you. I'm going to (laughs) cry. Starting off with tears. I'm very blessed to know you, to have you as a friend, and uh, also blessed to be able to talk with you this show because I never get to talk to her. She's so busy. Uh, we, (laughs) We have on the table the subject that is going to be difficult to talk about, and yet we're going to do it in such a way that we pray you don't turn off this video because we all need to hear it and we all need to do something about it. And it's abortion. And Patricia is the subject of a book called Transfigured. Up on the screen now we have the new version, which is new and improved as if it could have been improved because her story is fantastic. Kids love it. Grandpas love it. I mean, 
<laughs> Truly, it's it's uplifting. It's I mean, abortion uplifting. Yes, it is because of God's mercy. And the Spanish version is endorsed by Emmanuel. For those of you in English speaking countries who have no idea who Emmanuel is, he is the Frank Sinatra of Latin America, of Mexico and Latin America. So uh, they they say it's one of the best books they've ever read because Patricia is one of the most fabulous apostles you'll ever meet. So the first part of the show, we're going to talk to Patricia, hear her story, a little bit of it without revealing all of the beans. And then we're going to talk about how abortion relates to chastisements, specifically the chastisement of the United States, because they are intrinsically interconnected. If we don't do something now, we're in trouble. And I could have easily had several abortions. Patricia had three. And those of you who've had abortions, it's time to heal if you haven't already. It's time to get on board. God loves you. God is mercy. But now is the time for all of us to get this to stop. Thank you so much, Christine, for having me on your show. It's a true honor to be here today with everybody that's tuning in. And it's a great honor also to know you and call you friend and family. And thank you so much for writing Transfigured with me. Um, but really, Christine, this is a story of God's redemption, God's love. It's really his, the story of his greatness, of his great mercy. Um, I just basically shared my sins, my failures, but it's really his infinite mercy that shines through these pages. I've had so many testimonials from youth, from elderly people, from priests, people from all over the world saying that this book really changed their lives. And not only did it change their pro-abortion mindset uh, to pro-life, but it's really changed their faith in the relationship with God. Um, so this book has been a huge blessing. And I think we're in a time where we need to do penance, mortification, and great reparation for this grave sin. The sin is like poison that's just leaking in all these countries all over the world. And I think it's it's time to do something about it now, Christine, like you mentioned, or uh, we're in big trouble. <laughs> I believe that the root of all evil is abortion. And mm -hmm. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said that there will never be peace in the world until there's peace in the womb. Wow. So if anyone's interested in seeing a bit more about Patricia, because today we won't be able to tell you everything about her. And, and you'll want to know everything about her, right, Patricia, by the end of this? <laughs> <laughs> so here I have on the screen her website, and it is www.patriciasandoval.com. So Patricia, can you share a bit of your story? I don't want to give away the book, but the book starts, we started writing it at Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the guy behind the counter likes Patricia, so he gave, through her, I got a free burger. Um, <laughs> and so we, she just started steer, sharing her story. And at the very beginning, she forgot that she worked at Planned Parenthood. So the Lord took Patricia, who wasn't going to talk about it with anyone, anyone, to sharing it with the whole world and brought back her memories. And then we started to write it. And then we didn't, we got halfway through the book, which was her past, and we came to her present. And then God would write the book through her life a month before we'd write it down. Something amazing would happen one month, and we'd catch up and write it down. And then something else amazing would happen, and we'd catch up and write it down. So this whole second half of the book was how God took her from someone who wasn't going to tell anybody anything to someone who was speaking around the world. I've had people tell me, I cried through your book. I laughed. It was, in like, it was an emotional roller coaster. I felt like I was living it with you. And I said, actually, you were living it with me because as, I, as you're reading the chapters, I was actually living that um, at the moment on the, the second part of the book. So it's beautiful because I do feel that when people cry, they are in a sense, I know God lives, you know, he doesn't live in time. He lives in eternity. But in a sense, people are kind of going through the emotions with me at, you know, at, at, at the time that they're reading it because I was actually living that so it's just it's I think and it took us eight years Christine <laughs> I know. eight years to write wow um, it was an amazing experience it was worth it 
You know, the book yeah. doesn't only cover abortion. Uh, the, the book covers, you know, the lies of the new age and the dangers of being involved with a new age practice, right? Um, the book goes over chastity, abandonment, divorce, you know, vanity um, issues, fear, issues of fears and low self-esteem. And, and it goes over a lot of things. And I feel like even though you haven't had an abortion, you can find yourself in the somewhere in that book. You can relate somehow. So I just feel that the book covers so many topics and so many experiences and so many emotions and so much healing as well. Can you just share your story encapsulated? There's there's one of the most beautiful moments, I think, in the history. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound like I'm exaggerating, but I really believe this. Having had my own miraculous healing and conversion to Catholicism, people hear my story and it's beautiful, but yours rocks this world. Can can you share just very briefly the sins that led up to the moment that Christ came to you? Right. So we started out as a family abandoning God completely. We were all baptized in the Catholic faith. We started um, believing in all the new age practices and got very heavily evolved. And I mean, we just had we didn't have Jesus as the king of our home and our family. It was literally Satan in our household. It tore my family apart. And I just dealt with issues of abandonment, of anger towards my mother that had left. That was pretty rebellious growing up and um, had a liberal mindset. I was pretty much pro-abortion. Didn't live a life of chastity. Ended up having three unwanted pregnancies. Very ignorant. Didn't know that I had life inside of me. I had false education in my sixth grade class. I didn't know that a baby existed in my womb. I was told during my sexual intercourse class that my sex ed class, that it wasn't a baby till five months gestation. So I had three abortions, which I suffered terribly after. I didn't, I was lied to in the clinic. Nobody told me that post-abortion syndrome existed. Basically, they told me that I was just going to have some cramping and bleeding, and that was it. That was my um, that was going to be my post procedure symptoms that I was going to have. But I had depression, anxiety. I had nightmares. I was traumatized when I saw children. I had suicidal thoughts. There was times I wanted to take my life away, and I didn't I didn't understand why, or I didn't connect this you know any of these emotions and feelings and mental illness to abortion. I uh, started to work for Planned Parenthood as an illegal nurse, never went to nursing school, didn't have the credentials. They were just very excited that I was post-abortive and that I had had three abortions because this was going to help motivate the girls to come to their abortion appointment. I was to counsel these girls, convince them, and it was then when I worked behind the doors of Planned Parenthood that I lived the most horrific experience of my life. I don't think there's anything else that could exist in this world that is so horrific than working behind the doors of an abortion clinic. That's where I saw that I was lied to. That's where I saw my raw reality that I didn't abort three sacks of tissues or three sacks of, uh, you know, blobs. I aborted three children, you know, three of my own children. I, I was to look for the the body parts after each abortion. And that's where I saw the shocking reality of abortion and throw these babies away in the garbage. And it was so traumatizing for me. I was only there for about three weeks uh, at the abortion clinic at Planned Parenthood. And I got very involved into cocaine, methamphetamine. And I basically was homeless after a couple of weeks of using drugs. And I was completely lost, lived in um, an abyss of darkness, um, addicted to drugs, just wanting to not live anymore, away from my friends and family. And uh, one day I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't take it anymore, Christine. I was tired of life. I was hungry. I was tired. I was on the streets and I looked like a dead woman walking. I literally looked like a skeleton with no hair, bald, just bones. And there was no life inside of me anymore. And this is when I cried out to God. You know, I... Like I said, we got very involved in New Age as a child, but I did remember when I did my first communion, I did remember my CCD classes, and I did remember that, you know, that Jesus had died for me on the cross for my sins. I was taught that as a very as a child, and it was those seeds. You know, I always tell parents this. 
parents that are concerned that their children are away from the church, those, the baptism and the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of Holy Communion, those are seeds. Those are seeds that are so fruitful when, when, when your children are away from the church. I, I really believe that they're lassos that, that can bring a child back. And I cried out to God on the streets and asked for help, you know, and I asked for his forgiveness. And at that very moment that I cried out to the heavens, a young girl that was looking at me through a restaurant window, uh, she's a waitress, ran out and told me that she was praying for me and that God told her in her heart that he forgave me for all that I've done and that he loved me and that he would never abandon nor forsake me. And that young girl took me home after three years. And that was just the pure divine mercy. I mean, that was a Faustina moment right there. It was God's rays of divine infinite mercy just showering over me and thanks to that young brave girl that was obedient to the voice of God I came home and also found out that my mother had been praying for me and that she had gone come back to the Catholic Church she had gone home come back home to the Catholic faith and that she was sacrificing for me every day she was on her knees praying for me in front of the Blessed Sacrament. She was offering every rosary, fasting, and offering every Eucharist for me. And that, obviously, that's why I'm alive today. It's because of God's divine mercy and my mother's prayers. You mentioned St. Faustina, and I know that St. How that Saint Faustina has been part of your journey. And can you share a little bit how your life is intertwined with hers and then also leading up to what happened with her and abortion and where it's leading us today. Her diary changed my life. I was always scared of suffering. I always asked God, why do I have so much suffering? You know, um, my family is just torn apart. Everything just goes wrong for me. I suffered these three, three abortions and even serving in the pro-life movement, things started to go kind of bad for me, right? I had a lot of persecution a lot of spiritual warfare. And I just, I was really terrified of suffering. And when I read her diary, it completely changed my heart. I realize now that suffering uh, helps to sanctify my soul and suffering is a key to sainthood and suffering is the key to, to the doors of heaven. And so her diary really helped me heal the fear of suffering and actually embrace it and, and to hold my cross just like she did. And there is a moment in her in her life where she was praying at night and God let her bear these really heavy and painful cramps in her womb and in her diary she writes that it was such an unbearable pain that she thought she was going to die and our Lord let her know that he was letting her do reparation for all those evil mothers that killed their children in the womb and I was pretty. I was pretty shocked when I when I when I read that, and I realized uh, that I need to do the same thing. That I was forgiven so much. You know, I had two choices, Christine. Thank God that I healed a lot through a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, my three abortions. But I had two choices, Christine. I can keep the healing to myself, be mm. silent about my story, and just move on with my ordinary life, and just be like, you know, having my nine to five job, and just just live life kind of like in a worldly way. Or my second choice was to tell my story. And I knew that I was going to lose family members. I knew I was going to lose friendships. I knew that I was going to be persecuted. But I knew that I had to do reparation for what I've done. I know that there was a lot of people out there suffering in silence and that they too needed healing and they just needed that bridge, right? I just feel that I became a bridge at that point. And so, you know, her, her diary and her life and just giving that message of mercy, I think my mission, my pro-life mission, because there's a lot of branches in the pro-life movement, I feel that mine is to lend, to extend that message of mercy to, to other people that have suffered abortions. And so she's, I, she's a great saint, and I feel that she's one of my friends, and her diary, like I said, has changed my life, and I've gotten to know even more so how, how beautiful God's mercy is for, for his children. And people, I, I 
led Rachel's Vineyard retreats for a while, and that's actually how I met Patricia originally. Mm-hmm. That's that's another cool story. Um, that if this doesn't go on too long, maybe I can tell that at the end. But if you have been through an abortion, or you're a man who's wife or partner experienced an abortion, or if you're a grandmother whose child had an abortion, Rachel's Vineyard is for you. And while we can move about, while COVID hasn't shut everything down, at least in some parts of the world, please, 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 even if you don't think you need healing, you'll be surprised at the graces and mercy that God wants to give you that you probably, because this is an unknown thing, we have depression and anxiety if we've had an abortion, uh, we as human beings, but we don't always know that our symptoms are linked to a past abortion. It's it's compartmentalized in our brain. So we are suffering things in the present and human beings, if we've had an abortion, that happened from it, right? But the mind doesn't know that. The mind doesn't see that. So please go. Just go. Go to another state if you have to. Please, people go to other states if there's an abortion um, healing retreat called www.rachelsvineyard.org and you click on where you are in the country or in the world and and find even if there's only one retreat left you will not regret it because now is the time and Patricia we talked about this before the show there's also uh, Father Chris Alar did a video that revealed something connected with St Faustina and now being the time to just stop this it it has to stop and the and because we reap what we sow so what was it that Faustina learned from God regarding abortion and what happened in Warsaw right so Faustina had a vision of, of an angel of the Lord destroying all of Poland because of Warsaw. And so she pleaded God for, for his mercy, for forgiveness for her country. And because they, is, deci- because they decided to make abortion legal? Is that what happened? What happened? Well, there were in Warsaw. I think they had back alley kind of like abortion oh. places back then. Like, uh, And so, um, God, you know, she pleaded for God's mercy. And that's where he gives her the, the chaplet of the divine mercy to pray. Mm-hmm. And it was because a lot of women were killing their children in the womb. Right. And or, you know, there's other ways, too. How women actually do it themselves at home, which is pretty brutal. But so it was through abortion, basically in Warsaw, that our Lord was going to destroy the whole country. Wow. And he gives the chaplet, and this is where he reveals to her that you know this chaplet is so powerful that it could stop wars. And so that's where the chaplet of divine mercy is linked to to abortion, basically to you know, ask God for mercy and to do an act of reparation on our part for this grave sin. And I don't, I don't think people know that. I, I feel, and I was this way as a Catholic, I think until I went, I learned about God pulled me into post, post-abortion healing ministry. It wasn't my choice. I, I didn't really get it. I didn't really get what you say, Patricia, all the time that this is everybody's issue. These messages we're getting from heaven, and there's a website I encourage you to go to called countdowntothekingdom.com. And I'm going to, and Patricia's going to hear these messages for the first time, but I searched on the web for messages that have to do with abortion being linked to this kind of punishment, hence reparation is needed. And we're, we're right on the cusp of that. Speaking of St. Faustina, So she said, as many of us know, that, uh, or this is what Jesus said to her, before I come as a just judge, I first open wide the door of my mercy. And this is what Patricia walked through. He who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. Now, there's a woman named, she goes by the name of Jennifer, and she started to, she was very nominal Catholic. She thought Sodom and Gomorrah were a couple of people and that the Beatitudes were a rock group. She really wasn't um, very familiar with her faith. And the Lord started to speak, speak to her after communion. She ended up with a spiritual director, went 
to find Pope John Paul II in the Vatican, was led inside the Vatican. Jesus told her to give her messages to him. They ended up on Pope John Paul II's lap. And his secretary, Monsignor Powell, said to her, spread the message spread the messages to the world any way that you can. So that's who I'm going to read from just for a couple messages here. There are others, other authentic mystics who've made this connection. And on January 4th, 2021, Jesus said to Jennifer, my child, those who have committed these unjust acts upon my little ones within the womb and outside the womb are bathing themselves in the blood of the innocent. When they seek to destroy my creation, my plan, know that the hour of justice is coming. It is in the blood of the innocent that mankind will find that his hour of reckoning has come. So hour of reckoning, what does that mean? We go to another message that Jesus gave her. My people, this world will not rest from war, disease, and famine, for my people will soon face great devastation for the number of my little ones killed through abortion. Again, on another message. And this is where, you know, Patricia, I, I think I still get shocked when you say that this is, this is the greatest sin. This is the biggest problem. Definitely the world doesn't think that. It um, it's, can be a, even a cosmetic necessary procedure. I mean, that's how some people take it. I don't think we tend to think of it as the greatest sin that can bring on chastisements. I think that that's, that's just too much. And it's too much to take. And yet here it is in our face. This other message through Jennifer says, has Jesus saying, the greatest sin is abortion. And I will not allow this evil to continue. You know, so my goodness, there we have it. We have God saying, I'm not going to allow it. So that leaves two choices, right? If he's not going to allow it, either we stop it or he does. If we stop it now, everything's going to be pretty great. <laughs> we have other problems we need to work through. Granted, there are other things to work through. It's not like things change on a dime, but great graces and mercy will fall upon us. If he's saying he's not allowing it to continue and we don't stop it, then he has to stop it through his justice. And that's not, and that's not fun. <laughs> and that's not pretty. So to continue with this message, the greatest sin is abortion. I will not allow this evil to continue. These areas where the riches and powers of the world are most present will come tumbling down. There are many evil souls who seek to bring down a nation that has become the leader of the world, yet also the leader of killing my little ones. Further down, it says, It is through the breaking of the fifth commandment, which is thou shalt not kill, that this world will see a great chastisement. Be on guard, for nations will soon rise up against one another. Are we starting to see that now? That will send forth great disruptions in your way of life. The mountains will awaken even those that lie below the far depths of the sea. So that's just Jennifer. There are two other prophets I can mention. But uh, how does that strike you, Patricia, in terms of connecting what's starting to happen in the world and, and how we're acting and how we think? Well, I, will, like, I, can, I can give you Mexico for, a, for an example. Since abortion has been decriminalized in, in Mexico, the violence just is out of control right now with the cartel. And there is a testimony. There is a man in Michoacan, the state of Michoacan in Mexico, who is possessed. He offered his his life as a victim soul for the reparation of abortion in his country. In his country, he was taken to the Vatican by a priest named Padre Juan Rivas, um, and he was taken to Pope Francis. And Pope Francis said, "Take him to Father Amorth. Um, he was the head exorcist of the Vatican. He just uh, passed away a couple years ago. And during that exorcism, what was revealed were these four top demons that were speaking through Angel. That that is a possessed man. That's from Michoacan. And these four demons revealed that they are the same four demons that existed existed before the apparition of Guadalupe. They are the demons that basically uh, they're 
uh, greatest power is human sacrifice. And now that Mexico has decriminalized abortion, they are back on the throne. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe is greatly offended. And these, during this exorcism, these demons did reveal to Father Amorth and three other priests that were uh, there during, during the exorcism that Mexico was gonna have an outreach of violence through the cartel, that the same amount of abortions that would be performed in Mexico would be the same amount of um, violence and beheading and kidnapping. So the numbers do go in alignment. Um, This is something that's well known in Mexico. It's on YouTube and Spanish uh, for all of you that speak uh, Spanish. But um, I believe that it's the same things happening in our country. I mean, how many kids aren't getting, having positions of guns and just doing all these massive shootings at schools. You know, we, we never used to see this, Christine. And we also know by, uh, you know, I, a couple of people that have been involved in Satanism also as well, mm-hmm. that they need also ch- children's sacrifice to perform any type of, you know, rich, ritual or uh, anything that they want to obtain that, you know, they use. The, the most ultimate sacrifice that they can use during a ritual is a child that they kill. Is a sac- like you said, the sacrifice of innocent blood. But I completely believe that uh, the root of evil, the root of war, the root of violence, um, of killing, and just all this bloodshed that we're having in our country and other countries is because of abortion. I do believe that. And, you know, when I first heard Mother Teresa say something along those lines, I I didn't get it. And I thought, well, that... and. This is right after my conversion. Well, that seems really extreme. You know, someone having an abortion over here in Kansas, what does that have to do with, you know, Russia bombing the Ukraine or something like that? I don't get it. How how are those linked? And we're talking about the spiritual realm. We're talking about when that happens. And, and once again, I think, Patricia, you would agree with me that Jesus never condemns the sinner. He just condemns the sin. He loves people who have abortion. He's just asking for repentance. That's all he needs, just repentance. So please don't think, oh, I'm evil. I can't be forgiven. Look at Patricia. She had three. Like, there she is, right on the screen. (laughs) Okay, there. You know, and this abortion, this abortion is like, we think of, when we think of abortion, we think of the abortion clinics. But what about the laboratories, right? What about all the in vitro, the, uh, you know, the women and, and, and couples that, uh, you know, they submit to in vitro. Those are multiple abortions. Those are babies that are frozen and they're discarded. They're thrown away in the garbage. We've got birth control. We've got the day, what is it, the plan B, the, the, the day after pill. There's so many other forms of abortions that, I mean, if we do get rid of, you know, abortion laws, then we've got to get rid of birth control. we got to get rid of the, the, all these laboratories that are that are killing, killing children as well. You know, this is this is a big octopus that we're dealing with. Right. It's become institutionalized. You, you have, right. you know, um, and this is really helpful in the Transfigured book because Patricia discovers a lot of this underground uh, abortion network that's going on in terms of facial creams being made from uh, aborted fetuses and, you know, health pills and things like that. that, That's just shocking that the average Jane and Joe is not aware of. And so this connection, it's, it's, it's demons being unleashed. That's why we can see more violence in war. They, they, they don't care whether it's an abortion or, or a killing. It's, it's just death. It is causing havoc. And, I'll go into this other message. Now, this is from Luz de Maria de Bonilla. Her messages have the imprimatur, and she is a mystic with the stigmata. She lives in Costa Rica. I personally, this is my opinion, means nothing. Uh, She submits all her messages to the church. They are transcribed and vetted by a couple priests and a nun. And here's one that came from, let's look at the date, uh, December 30th, 2020. And this is from St. Michael. And he says, premeditated abortion is a crime against the gift of life. God blessed humankind. And it has responded with aberrations against the gift that it has received. The divine word is not respected. Those who are in charge of guiding the people of God do not apply heavy sanctions needed for this generation to desist from other aberrations, meaning leadership is supposed to say no is not a good idea, 
And leadership is supposed to let us know there'll be repercussions. Deliberate abortion is a crime permitted on earth, and because of this, we suffer in heaven at the hardness of the human heart. And, you know, Patricia, you mentioned how in this exorcism, the demons are revealing what they're doing, who they are, and how they've taken up their positions again to be able to influence the earth. And the Lord here is referring back to biblical times where he's trying to explain, yes, we don't have abortion specifically in the Bible, but we do have thou shalt not kill. (laughs) You know, we do have this particular passage that St. Michael points out where he says, remember Cain, he killed his brother Abel and God passed sentence repercussion. God, faced with the evil of his terrible sins, said to Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If we don't stop, if we don't stop, What the Lord is saying, we'll be cursed from the ground. Nature will rise up against us. Not just those who've had abortions and are unrepentant, but everybody. Because when we know something is wrong and we don't do anything about it, we don't speak and we don't try to help those people who don't understand by giving them a book like Transfigured. Seriously, give someone the book who doesn't get it. And by the end of the book, can we not say, Patricia, that they tend to get it? There's a conversion of heart. There's a conversion of understanding that happens. We're responsible if we don't do something that simple, like handing someone a book. So it says, whoever consents to the practice of an abortion should repent, confess, and turn away from this terrible sin. Our King and Lord Jesus Christ sees inside every human being and deals with each soul on its own. Change your lives. Convert. Abortion, far from being a fashion, is a crime against an innocent person. Satan's minions are working hard to spread abortion on a global scale. Poor humanity, the weight of its own sins, will again fall upon it. There's a couple of exorcists, exorcists like Father Ripiger, and there's some in, in Latin America that say that abortion is actually Satan's communion. Mm. Um, actually gives them, you know, it gives evil more, more power. And nowadays, Christine, I mean, they, abortion is available in schools. There's a couple of schools in California that I know oh of, I think goodness. it's colleges where they, they hand out, you know, the abortion pill, where they hand out the plan B pill, which is, a you know, it's abortifacient, um, uh, it's an abortifacient. And now they're trying to get Planned Parenthood, like little mini Planned Parenthood clinics inside of the school so kids can make their abortion appointment during their break or, you know, after their lunch hour. And, um, you know, they're, 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 the battlefield right now is with the youth. It's inside of the universities, inside of the schools. It's with your children. It is with your grandchildren. I mean, the evil one is after the young ones. And like I, like I had mentioned in my story, they gave me, um, you know, false education. Um, They taught, they gave me a a, a, a really distorted sexual education course when I was 12 years old, which made me basically pro-abortive, you know, mindset. And and it, and I know that that also had a lot to do and it had a lot of influence with the decision that I made to have three abortions. And so, Christine, what are we going to do if we have wounded women that have had abortions, wounded men? I mean, what kind of families are we going to have? What kind of wife can a, can a woman be if she's had multiple abortions? What kind of father or husband can, can men be if the, he's wounded by multiple abortions? And I want to say that men also have multiple abortions. I've met men that have had one abortion and it leads to more. You know, it's not just a woman's issue. It's also a, a male issue. And so what kind of society are we going to have? If families aren't healthy and, and striving for sainthood, I mean... Abortion really does attack the whole family. I mean, it kills the unborn child. It uh, could kill the mother, but it spiritually kills the mother and the father. And we're just left with the wounded world. That's what we're left with. And the father, maybe there's a father who wanted to prevent it, but legally in the United States, he has no recourse. If he has a wife who conceived eight times and he would have had eight children, but now he has eight aborted children, he has no recourse. You can't say anything. And 
on a personal note, I took my husband to Rachel's Vineyard. He has a child in heaven. And he went through an abortion with his uh, girlfriend long ago. And he didn't know, once again, I, I speak about that differentiation between your suffering, but you have no idea it had anything to do with your girlfriend's abortion long ago, but it does. So he shut down. He just was emotionally unavailable. He just went kind of numb. He didn't love people like he used to, and he didn't let them into his own life like he used to. And that came back after he went to, he loved Rachel's Vineyard, www.rachelsvineyard.org. Please get healing. And so also just to just to say I could have had several abortions and I and I remember Patricia before the show this memory came to mind where I was I thought I might be pregnant and I was walking through this field of grass and brambles and I was freaked out and I didn't know there was a god but I thought I'll be okay if I am pregnant at least I can have an abortion. I was so grateful, so grateful for the possibility to get one, should I be pregnant, which leads me to believe had I been pregnant, that's where I would have gone and that's why, where I would have done. So I too was raised in a culture that told me that that's the answer if you don't want a pregnancy. There was nothing in my mind about a child, nothing in my mind about killing. I mean, that's absurd. That was off the table. It was just a gracious, wonderful thing that the world was offering me to get out of my trouble. And so is there anything you want to say to close, Patricia, that encourage people to, honestly, we have this audiobook. We did all these eight years of work for the book, Transfigured for a Reason. And it's in Spanish for a reason. And we didn't do it for self-glory. <laughs> the Lord put us through this so that it could be for you. And we, we imagine that the people watching the show are by and large already in agreement what we're saying because of the, the people who watch this show. We're hoping not. We're hoping that you totally disagree with us and came to watch this. But if you're totally in agreement, Please do something to share. Please be bold. You will not regret it. What would you have people do with like the DVD that they can get and, and other things and your book? Well, I, I do believe, and, and I say this during my conferences, during my talks, I do believe that the moment that we're created and the time and the generation that we're created, it's perfectly in God's plan. I do believe with my heart that on our judgment day, when we face God, when we're at his throne, he will tell us, you were born in a generation where there were mothers killing their children in the wombs and fathers as well. What did you do for them? You know, you were, you were, you were, you were born into a generation where it was normalized and legalized, you know, to kill a baby in, in, in their mother's womb. Did you do anything for them? Did you pray for them? Did you do anything? Did you lift up your voice? Did you, what, what did you do for them? And I, I think we will be held accountable. And it's not to make anybody feel bad, but I think we are called at this time to do something about it. This is the greatest war that's ever existed. I know that we have, you know, this issue, this situation, this very sad situation with you, you, the Ukraine and with Russia. But we have a larger war that hasn't ended in decades. And it's killed millions, not just children, Christine, we're talking about millions of generations, because we have to remember, when one child is killed through abortion, his whole lineage is killed, his whole generation is wiped out. And we've had close to 70 million generations wiped out in our country alone. Those are the ones that are counted. What are we doing about it? Are we doing anything? And that's, it's just, you know, I just want to motivate it. Everybody watching, you are called to this movement. You are called to be pro-life. Thank God for Our Lady's yes. We have the whole moment of the Annunciation where Our Lady said, let God's will be done. Let it be according to thy, to thy word. If it was not for her yes, it, it wasn't <laughs> for her saying yes to God's will at that moment, we wouldn't have salvation. And that's an example 
you know, Mary didn't have the best circumstances at the moment. You know, she could have gotten stoned to death. And it's an example where the children of the Virgin Mary were Christian, were Catholic. These are our brothers and sisters dying in, in their mother's wombs. We are called to do something about it. And I feel that this book has been, for many people, an injection of gasoline, like a fuel to motivate them uh, to not be scared to be bold and to defend life. Because I remember when I first started to defend life, I was attacked. I was embarrassed to defend life. I was embarrassed to share things on my social media. But now more than ever, I know that I have to be courageous and bold because we're all called to be bold and courageous. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who runs against the current and that will give their life for what they believe in. And we're called to be bold. And so I really do want to motivate people that are watching this, if you have teens, to get this book for their teenager. It really has changed the life of, of the young people, you know, to give it as a gift. Uh, if you have a couple of teens in your family, buy a couple of these books, give it out to them. This book, like I said, has been translated in different countries. I have people write to me in different parts of the world, and it's changed their faith, their relationship with God, and it's changed Catholic people's stance on abortion. I mean, you've got Catholic people, you know, with a pro-abortion mindset that have said, I was, I'm Catholic, but I believed in abortion and I thought abortion was a woman's right, but this book completely changed my heart. And I know that I, that I was wrong. And, um, so this book has been a big blessing for, for many people. And I think it's, I think it's a book for our times now, especially what we're going through now in the world with, um, all these abortion laws left and right. I mean, we've got we have laws of infanticide now in our country. I don't know if people know this, but we have in New York where a woman and the abortionist that the baby is born, it's between them if the baby lives or not, the baby that is born. And now we have this bill that is also waiting to be approved in Colorado. So not only do we have, I mean, abortion legal until nine months in the womb in our country, but now infanticide is being legalized in our country, which is horrific, Christine. And uh, this is a book for the times that we're living in now. And don't be scared of it. It's it's very hopeful. It's full of mercy. People don't leave it depressed. They leave it enlightened and hopeful. So we want to let you know about that, about Transfigured. And I just thought of this as you were speaking. Uh, Patricia and I did a video, and she just mentioned this reality that people don't think about, that it's not just an aborted child. If that child were to have had children, it's their children and their children and their children and their children. So it's, it's not, it's many, many people, many generations that are prevented from happening that were in God's plan. So it's huge. And I think that what you've said, Patricia, can't help but awaken the sleeping giant that we can help people. We can give a book, have a conversation, show a video, and save a life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray for us. Yes, pray for us. And I thank you, Mother. Uh, you are uh, the Queen of the Americas, the Empress of the Americas. I thank you for your message of life here in the Americas. I thank you because we had previously invited you to this talk. I ask that you wrap us all in your mantle of love. And Lord, I thank you for this divine moment that you've given all of us. I thank you for everybody watching. And I ask that you talk, you speak to their heart. I ask, uh, Lord, that through this book, if they do decide to purchase it for their family members, for themselves, that you speak to them, Lord, through the pages and that your mercy shines once again in their lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the people that defend life. And we ask, Lord, that you give us a discernment. How can we defend life? How can we help end this Holocaust of abortion? Thank you, my Lord and my God, for the gift of our life and the life of our family members. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Patricia, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for your yes. Thank you for all you do. Uh, I started uh, this show about to cry. I'll end it about to cry. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. God bless everyone. Thank you. Amen. And may you find your way home.